Okay. See if that'll work. Yeah, backpack. You can have to move, buddy. Alright, guys, so 43. Section what now? 2.3. Oh yeah, okay, okay, beautiful. Um, quite a few people had trouble with these, these absolute value things. So let's just focus on what absolute value does. Because right? you think you know, but some of you guys don't really know. Um, so I mean, the basics of absolute value, pretty straightforward. Correct. What, ap what does an absolute value do? I like it. So if it's already positive, it leaves it alone, right? I don't know where the good place is for this. We'll figure it out. So, I mean, for example, absolute value negative four is? Four. 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 The absolute value of two is? Two. 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 Absolute value of zero is? Zero. Zero. So zero is the only thing that does not become positive. But anybody, real quick, why is it always make it positive? What idea is it based on? Uh, it's distance of any number to zero. Yes, based on distance. So even if I, you're like four feet away from me, even if I turn around, you're still four feet. I'm not going to say negative four, because that would be like you're inside. Right? <laughs> um, so this is distance. That's why it always comes out to be positive. So what the hell is this? Positive x. What could x be? Negative. Could x be negative? Yeah. Could x be negative? Yeah. Yes. Right? What can you make x? Is there any restrictions on x? So I can make it negative 2, couldn't I? And if x is negative 2, then it actually doesn't equal it. It doesn't equal this then, does it? So this is not correct. What does it do if x is positive or 0? Does the absolute value do anything if it's positive or 0? No. Leaves it alone, correct? Okay. Is somebody with me so far? Yeah. Absolute value 2, it did nothing. Zero, it did nothing. Negative four, oh shit, it did something, right? So if it's already at least zero, it leaves it alone. That's a little semicolon. Looks like a J. So what if it's negative? There we go. It changes the sign, and how do you change anything sign? Multiply it by a negative. Let me stop for a minute. Does that look weird? It sort of should, because, I mean, if you look at this, it, some people say, no, Jeff, how, how is it coming out negative? Well, in this case, x is negative. So let's do this according to the rule. The input is less than, oh, oh shit. Let's do, let's, let's do this. The input is less than 0. So it's got to be the negative of what it was. And of course, that's positive, too. Ground shaking stuff, right? But so, what about this? Negative x plus five. If what? It's not always negative if, x plus five. If x is less than zero. No, 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 no. What was this? Why did I say this? Because if the inside is positive or zero, if the inside is less than zero, so if the inside is at least zero. Somebody with me. If the, if the number I put inside, and what's the number inside? X minus five. If that number is already positive or zero, it won't do anything. All right. So what's what's true about X then? X has to be greater than five. Yeah. So this equals. Uh, so if this inside is already zero or more, it leaves it alone. What if X is less than five? Then the sign's got to change. So how do you change uh, this guy's sign? Multiply by negative one. Multiply by negative one, like, or make him be born in a different month. Right. Sorry, bad joke. So when, this is cool. So then this will be negative x plus five, which is what you said earlier. Yes. But there's a negative uh, outside of the first bracket. That all right? That's simple, right? Because just, I so know what this does. So what would this do? The opposite. Yes. 
So as long, if I know what that is in all the cases, I just multiply each one by a negative, right? So the important thing is, what the hell is the absolute value? And anything else outside of it, I then worry about next. Yeah. All right. So, what does this problem say? Uh, what was it at? Let's see. 43. Okay. 43 is a little gross, right? Because uh, the limit, Jeff. Where are you going? There it is. All right, I gotta bring my glasses. Kids, don't get old. Negative 0.5. I love it. So it's my this. So that bottom, that, that denominator is disgusting. Does anybody agree with me? Yeah. But it's not as bad as you think. Because what should you immediately think to do with it? Just kind of ignore the absolute value for a second, because the inside's much worse than normal, yeah. Factor? Yeah. So how do you factor this? Let's uh, just look at this by factor out x squared. Right? Now, what's the absolute value of x squared? Nope. What's true about x squared? It's always, positive. it's always positive or zero. So, will the absolute value ever do anything to x squared? Nope. Ignoring complex numbers, by the way, right? This is all about real shit so far. So far. Okay. So, this would equal, is everybody equal this? Watch. Absolute value of x squared is x squared. Absolute value of 2x minus 1? I don't know. So now what do you have? It's a negative, yeah. Uh, where are we at? 2x minus 1 over x squared times 2x minus 1. And I think this isn't from one side or the other, right? It is from the left. Okay, so it is from a certain side. Now, does something scream out at you that you should be able to do something with it eventually. Yeah, um, cancel out the two x. No, you can't do it right now, can you? No, no. You can't do it right now because there's not an absolute value of two x minus one at the top, so they're not the same, so they won't cancel. But what does this mean here? Coming from the negative direction. You're approaching negative a half from the, negative. the left. So think about it. Isn't one half where this is zero? So uh, I'm sorry. Uh, why is it negative? Did I put it? Is it negative or did I just? It's a positive one half. Oh, it's a positive, okay. That's my, I really need to bring my glasses. All right, let me try this one. So at one half is where this is zero, correct? So on one side or the other of one half is where it changes signs, correct? If I'm below a half, if I'm approaching a half from the right, from the left, what sign is this? So put a number in there, right? What's what? Give me a number less than a half. Zero. Zero. Holy shit! What do you get when you put a zero in there? What kind of number? Negative. 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 Right? Every number below a half that you put in here is going to become negative inside, correct? So what will the absolute value do to it then? Make it Yeah, negative. I really want that makes all the sense in the world. Well, how do I know that this equals that exactly because they told me I was approaching from the left. So I know every number I put in there is gonna make this number negative, and I know what the absolute value does. It multiplies it by a negative to change its sign. And now, what happens here? They cancel. Yeah. So you still have a negative right here, right? So this is the limit as x approaches. Now, I've done too much. I always do this. Everybody cool? Do you, you guys see that progression? Mm -hmm. So you can right. like, I'm confused. You can invert the absolute value like because it's approaching from the left. Okay. Is, that? Oh, is that yours? Yeah. So you can like invert the absolute value because it's approaching from the left? Yes, exactly. So if I told you, so this one was like, I had no idea. But if I said, I'm only using numbers below five, then I know it would only be this option. Right? Yeah. 
because I know the number inside would end up being negative. So if I'm only using numbers that are less than a half, whatever that is is going to be a negative number. Therefore, the absolute value must change the sign of that thing. I really want this to make sense. Here, when we first did this, it could have been anything. I have no idea what x is. So I had to list both possibilities. Here, I know what x can go up to. So it's only one of the possibilities. And now you can, why couldn't I put a 1 half in in the beginning? From the very beginning, why, why couldn't I put a 1 half in? You get a 0 and then a number. You get a 0 over 0, right? Didn't we kill what makes it 0? Remember, I tried to make that really clear when I was talking about this. You want to eventually kill the reason it's 0 over 0 because what you're left with is a number. Or in some cases, infinity, but at least you can determine what the answer is then. All right, so these absolute value ones are definitely some of the more freakier problems, but especially if you forgot how they really work. Just saying that makes things positive is not good enough. It's not technical enough. Okay, maybe. I can see in some of your eyes you're all like, shit. <laughs> Does that sort of make some sense? Do you understand what you have to be careful about with absolute values? At least as you see how to attack a problem like this, that's what's important, right? Yes? I got like a different, I did like a, I did like in a different way, but I got the same answer, if that makes sense. How'd you do it? So I did like, on the wide black, I gave, I did like this and then. And oh, you changed the sign from the beginning. Yeah. So you might've noticed that this is negative for things. You might've noticed that off the bat. So that, that's fine. Uh, so you didn't take the x squared out. You just went ahead and said, well, this is negative below a half, so I'm going to change it some. That's fine. Yeah. OK. Anything else? Yes? Uh, the number five on the practice test? Yes. Oh, oh yeah. All right. Squeeze there. some piece of it to be bounded. What does bounded mean? What does bounded mean for a function? What do you think? That it doesn't go on bounded. Yeah, it's got outputs that are only appear between such and such, right? Sort of like cosine only has outputs between what and what? Oh. Cosine only goes between what and what? Negative one. But a negative one, right? Okay, so in this problem, is this a cosine? Where'd it go? What is it again? It's sine. That's number five on the five. Oh, five on the right. You're never going to find it there, Jeff. Uh, there, yeah, it's a sine. show that that equals zero. So I don't know if this feels like cheating to anybody or something, but we can, when we are trying to prove something or trying to investigate something, we could do a lot more shit to it than you kind of feel you can. Uh, so I'm just going to, which piece of this obviously is bounded? The sign. The sign, right? A cubic can go insane. That's not bounded. This is bounded. So what's true about this? Anybody? Now look, look. Anybody believe the outputs are affected by the weird ass thing inside? Only slightly. So tell me this. Is there anything that you could put inside of sine so that it comes out to be more than one or less than negative one? That's impossible. No, I mean, you could put cos. Can't you put like the inverse and make it like a so, yeah, well, oh, so you mean like uh, sine of an inverse cosine or something? Yeah. It, uh, so, let me make this 
Anything I put inside, won't it be a number? And don't we know that sine looks like this? How long does it do this? Forever. For freaking ever. So every number, every number possible, excluding imaginary numbers. You guys want to do imagine, uh, complex trigonometry? Okay. <laughs> so excluding complex numbers for the moment, every single number has the output for sine or cosine between 1 and negative 1. So whatever the shit I put inside, this is freaky shit, this is freaky shit, whatever this is, for any value of x, it's a number. Yes? And I know that whatever number, it's got to be between 1 and negative 1 for the output. So this has got to be between negative 1 and 1. Now we build what the actual function is that they asked us about. So this feels a little bit like cheating, I'm certain. But this is true, what I've written is true. But they want me to investigate this, so how do I make that show up in here? What do I have to do to everything? Yeah, multiply by this. So if I multiply the whole thing by this, x minus pi cubed. Maybe. Oh shit. And now I've got the function they want me to investigate. But what's the complete question? The complete question is what's the limit? So now I do the limit. Yeah, you can do it, buddy. Oh, God. Okay, everybody just sit there for a minute. Oh, my God. Okay. Jeff. So, what's this limit? Zero. Zero. What's that limit? Zero. So if this, if the result of this limit has to be greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to zero, the only thing it can be is yeah. zero. That's the idea of the squeeze theorem. It says it's bounded between these two. These two both become the same number. Therefore, the guy that's bounded has to be that number, whatever it is. I really love that theorem. It's crazy. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, I mean, yeah. So if you, if you graph this, it gets really neat. It won't look like this, but uh, some really neat ones would be some like, this is not what this, if I made it a square, and then you can have like a cosine living in the middle or something, right? So you can see it squeeze, and then right there, it's gotta be zero, because that's the only, I always think about Indiana Jones. We're gonna die in here, and things are nothing. <laughs> or if you went this way, it could be Star Wars. Yes. And then you see a little uh, hat that he reaches back to get. Okay. Is that better for squeeze theorem? Can you yes. do another one? Another one. So they're all going to be basically. What what else does a book give you? Just more numbers. <laughs> Here, um, here's one that's a little different. Um, let me see if this is too different. Uh, let's see if we could, yeah, we could do that. Let me think. That might be a little too much. That might be why I didn't assign it. This one is a little too straightforward. So, I mean, either they get really weird or they're pretty much the same thing. So, like, if I did this for, real quick, if I did this, is that what it is? Yeah. Right. Do you see how that's exactly the same problem we just did? Mm -hmm. What piece goes is bounded, cosine, then you, then you multiply by what else it needs, and okay. Okay, it's the exact same process. Okay. The other one I was looking at is this one. This might be a little bit too freaky. Is that what it goes to? Real quick, um, all right, let's 
see if you guys are cool. Real quick. This is not that bad, to be honest. Sine goes, well, actually, let me build it even better. What does sine do? What does sine do? It goes between uh, negative, one and one. negative one and one. I want an e to that. So let me do e to this, e to this, e to this. If you think about it, e to this has got to be at least e to the negative one and at most e to the first, yes? Because that's what sine does. Is that cool so far? Okay, and then what am I missing? So I got square root of x, e to the negative one, square root of x, e to the sine. My breath. Square root of x, e. And then when I do the limit, that'll be zero, right? That'll be zero, so this will be zero also. But they're all basically, you find the thing that's bounded, you write that down, and then you start multiplying or even doing stuff like raising to create what this is. And then you just attack it with limits. And you're all like, yeah, that's all you do, just attack with limits. Yes? On the test, are we allowed to use like notebook paper for work on the side? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, you can definitely use your own paper, uh, non-pre-written paper. Yes, yeah. uh, for sure, yeah, because I, I try to give some room, but you never know if it's going to be enough room. Yeah. That's going to be here, right? Yes. We're going to be in this room for the rest of the semester, <laughs> barring maybe another room <laughs> if we get kicked out of this room, but we'll be on campus. I'm saying we'll be on campus the rest of the semester. I'm knocking on wood because, yeah. So, wait, just make sure you close note the tests, close to Yes, close notes, close book, open brain, open calculator. Yeah. Okay, yes? Can you do a problem like number six on the hex test? Oh, okay. Somebody had a question about this kind of problem, and they basically have the same. Um, reasoning to them. One of the most important theorems you guys have to kind of at least loosely remember is all the um, functions that are continuous on their domain. So can somebody give me a function that is continuous on its domain? Okay, trig functions. Trig functions are continuous on their domain. Inverse trigs are continuous on their domain. X Polynomials continuous on the domain. Root functions. Root functions. Rational, functions. Rational functions. Exponential. Do we miss any? I can't remember. Isn't logarithmic? Okay. Logarithmic, yes. I love it. So you don't have to memorize that list, but you kind of have to know because on this problem, they give you a function that's composed. It's a piecewise function. So it's got two different pieces that exist at different times. Uh, where'd it go? Jeff, it's yours, your own. Okay. Um, this function by itself, where is it continuous? Everywhere. Everywhere. Uh, I know, I'm not writing the whole thing yet. This function on its own, does anybody realize what kind of function is this? Irrational? No. Irrational? No. Polynomial? Yes. Yeah. What, is, what kind of function is this? Polynomial, right? Oh. Yes? Yeah. What kind of function is this? Polynomial, yes? It's a number times. So what kind of function is this? Isn't that a number times x? Isn't that what that is? Yeah. The x isn't on the bottom, so it's not rational because it's not a ratio of functions of x, uh, polynomial functions of x. It's pretty kind of what you think. Okay. And of course, this guy, of course, same same way. It's it's cool everywhere, isn't it? They're both cool everywhere. So just say that. Maybe don't say they're both cool everywhere. Say. They both are continuous everywhere. So what is the only location where this function can have a problem? These both individually are cool. This function is composed of both turning off and turning on at different times. So what's the only location where this function can have a problem? And when you say that, where do they meet? They have to meet, don't they? So what do you check? That they're opposite the same value. 
Yes, you plug a pi over three into both and you make sure that they actually meet. So if you plug a pi over three into this one, is anybody concerned that it's not allowed to use pi over three? Am I allowed to put pi over three in here and get a point? Am I allowed to? No. Well, what I'm doing is actually figuring out what the open circle would be, right? Then the other one, we're hoping that its value fills that circle in. So then it's continuous, right? Sort of like putting a train track together. You want the train to be able to go. Okay. So you just have to plug a pi over three in and show that the outputs are the same. That means that they won't be a jump discontinuity. They'll actually match up. Is that? So all those piecewise functions, you have to look at them individually. Do they have any problems? And you have to address those. And then, and then the real key point is where one stops and the other one takes over. Is that better? Because there are several piecewise functions, and I know people continuously hate on piecewise functions. They're not, they're not bad. You know, like whatever you say, man. Um, number seven is extra credit, though, right? If you looked at that, and I say extra credit, but just to make sure you know. Um, okay. Anything else? General, specific, yes? Uh, number six on 2.3. Oh, this one says, justify each step by indicating the appropriate limit law. So this section kind of brings us in. We were sort of loose with what we were doing. And then this section says there are specific laws that tell us why we're allowed to do certain things. And one of the big ones, before I forget, let me make sure which one it is. It's the one that tells you when you're allowed. Oh, it isn't even here yet. That's right. This is so evil. Um, it was a little bit evil. No, that, that one makes sense, right? Yeah. Here we go. Well, I can't remember exactly where it is. Where are you? The only time you're allowed to directly put a number into a limit is if it is continuous at that number. And it's sort of like been behind the scenes. We don't do continuity until section 2.5, but it's sort of been behind the scenes this entire time. Because we put shit in before we did 2.5. But that's the reality, is you, you're not allowed to unless it's continuous. Um, so what does that have to do with anything, Jeff? I don't remember. Was it number, what was it again? Six? There it is. So, limit as u goes to whatever. Whatever. Negative two. So you, all you have to do is go back and just find out which limit law says you're allowed to pull this inside of the root, right? Which limit law says you're allowed to put negative two inside of a fourth power, right? So you just gotta go back through the limit laws and just pick which one. So don't just plug a negative two and get a number. It's not good enough. They want you to go back and look which limit law says I'm allowed to do this, right? I know that's kind of frustrating on that kind of problem because you're like, just plug a freaking negative two in, but they're just trying to really make you aware of what the laws are specifically. Is that? No. Yeah. So you can just look back. I'm not going to make you memorize the limit laws. I wouldn't ask you this question on the test. Because I'm, you know, limit law seven said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, anything I don't have memorized, I don't make you memorize. And I certainly don't have the limit laws memorized. Okay. But they're important. I don't want to. But they kind of make sense. They're kind of uh, pretty, they kind of hopefully make sense. Okay. Anything else? Again, it's wide open. Yes? Is there going to be an instance where you have to check continuity algebraically? Like continuity? Without a uh, algebraically, like without a table? Check continuity. Oh, well, I mean, that's sort of like this one. Oh, OK. This is checking continuity. Um, but it's a piecewise function. No, I meant like that. Like check like, oh, does it approach negative three? Oh. Um, There's a problem like that on the homework, unless I understood it wrong. <laughs> I probably understood it Do you remember which it one it was? What did I it, don't. Do you remember what, kind of what it said more specifically? I don't. I'm not sure what kind of yeah. problem that is. I think it was like evaluate, evaluate the limit, but all of them like ended up with a denominator of zero. Oh, so it was the infinite output limits. I think so. OK, OK, like OK. Those you have to be a little careful about because 
I think there's one like that on the practice test, right? Like uh, 3C. Yes. 3C is a free theory. Let me do a, a less free example of this. Um, uh, sure, Jeff. There you go, buddy. Uh, I like I don't want a table. I just want some reason, right? Is this indeterminate? When you plug a one in, what do you got on the top? Zero. What do you got on the top? When you put a one in? One. So it's already not indeterminate, correct? This is determinate. So I shouldn't have to do a table. I shouldn't have to do anything. I should be able to determine the answer. And the bottom, of course, goes to zero. See how I always put this in parentheses? Because one over zero doesn't make sense. But if I just put in parentheses, I'm like, this is the form it takes. I'm not giving that as a number answer. OK. So what could the answer be then if it's in the form constant over zero? Infinity. Some kind of infinity. Or it could be does not exist, right? So what do you then do? Well, how do you approach one? How many ways is there to approach one? Two ways. Two ways. So if you're coming at it from the right, so x, well, that's my fifth theory. If you're coming at it from the right, you're putting numbers in that are bigger than one. What values does this have? Positive. Positive, and so is the top, right? So that would be positive infinity. So the limit as x goes to 1 from above of this shift is positive infinity. What about if it's below 1? Negative. negative. Right? This one's negative. Up here, this is still positive because you're close to 1, right? So if you put 0.9 in up here, that's positive, correct? So that's positive over negative. So the limit as x goes to 1 from the left of this shift Negative infinity. So what's this answer? Does not exist because it doesn't even agree on how it doesn't exist. <laughs> Does that, so that's the reasoning you have to use. If it's in the form constant over zero, then you've got to think if it's below or above, do they match? If they both went to pot, if it was this, how would that change the answer? Now it's positive on both sides because that's always positive, isn't it? Then it would be positive. Then it agrees on how it's going out of control. Right? I'm sorry, somebody had a hand up. I was gonna ask, yeah, what if like it's always, is that, if it's always zero on the bottom, does that always mean that it's not existing? Yeah, all right. If it's constant over zero, it's some kind of does not exist. So this answer is still a does not exist answer. But, but it's a more specific. Yeah, it's a more specific way to not exist. They at least agree that they're going insanely up. Another one would be insanely down. But if it does this, it's like, that's like stupid bad. That's like infinitely down, and then the next step, you're infinitely up. Holy shit, that's just a flat out does not exist. I can't say anything more specific. I really want that to make sense, why we chose what we chose to, to use to answer these. Okay, yes? What if you're trying to solve it algebraically and it's zero over zero, like it's indeterminate? Oh, all right. Well, then, for example, and you can't cancel anything. Three C, yeah. right? Three yeah. C. What happens when you try to plug the number in? Negative two over zero. You get negative two over zero. Oh, that's right. I forgot. Three C is not a good example. Mm -hmm. Three C is a little weird. That's right. Three C is a little weird because it's worse than this, but you can factor the top of the, the bottom and cancel something, make it a little easier. Then you can reason like we did here. Right? So that's 3C. It's like one extra step. So what you're talking about, though, is more like 3B. Yeah. Right? Any time you get 0 over 0, or even infinity over infinity, or even other things we'll learn later. For example, uh, 0 to the 0. We'll talk about this later. What's 0 to any power? Zero. Zero. What's any power? Anything to 0 power? One. So this is somehow both. So that's another indeterminate form that we're going to deal with later. Right. But right now, we only know these two. So are you with me? Okay. 
So if it ever comes out to this or this, I still have people stopping here and just saying does not exist or something. No. What do we call this form again? I really want this to just make sense. What do we call that form? Indeterminate. Indeterminate. Meaning, can you get the answer from what you know? You cannot determine the answer. That's what that means. Which means you have to do something algebraic or a table, right? So if I had a problem like, uh, can you do it real quick? Oh yeah, well like 3B. I love 3B. I would love 3B. A goes to negative 6. Time we got it. Yeah. Where do you go? There it is. Number 3. So what happens when you plug negative 6 in? Uh, 0 over 0. Yeah, 0 over 0, which means you cannot give me an answer right now. It's impossible to determine the answer because it's indeterminate. So, of course, this is very obvious. If there's a radical in something, you think about conjugate, right? Right. You start to develop some uh, attack strategies, right? If I see a radical, so square root of x plus 1 or something, I attack it with a conjugate. If I see polynomial stuff, I try to factor it, right? So, everybody's favorite's on the top here. Right? Trinomial. Trinomial, yeah. Well, cubes. So how do I factor the top here? A plus six. Remember this has to do with that movie Pulp Fiction. A plus six. <laughs> so I got one A here and one six here. I need the other two A's and the other two sixes there. And the middle term is always opposite sign so it can cancel shit. Right? Perfect. Stuff. And whatever this is times whatever that is. That's how cubes always works. Always. Does everybody fly? And of course, I, told, I think I told you about soap, right? Did I tell you soap? Have you heard about soap, everybody? <laughs> Not you should start looking into it. But same sign, opposite sign, always fine. Personally, I kind of hate these things. This is the least hated thing for me, I guess. A little soap thing. I don't like songs and shit because it takes you away from the idea. But that's my own weird little thing. And this is over, and how do I factor this? Two. I can take a 2a out, and wouldn't it be a squared minus 36? And isn't that a plus 6a minus 6? So now you can see, here's the beautiful thing. Can you see what is making it 0 over 0? Can you see what's making it 0 over 0? Stupid a plus 6 is right, because they're both 0 and negative 6. So if I kill them, now I can put negative 6 in, because now it's not indeterminate anymore. It's so direct. I, you got to love that shit. There, there's a problem. OK. No, no, no. All right, real quick. Before I forget this, before I finish this thought, not a life lesson. Not a life lesson. Can they hear it? There's a problem. OK, let's kill it. Right, nice. <laughs> Math lesson, because when you kill these things, as far as I know, they can't feel it. Find out later that they feel it. I'm like, oh, no, variables have killed so many. Um, that's a terrible horror match for me. Now I can plug a negative 6 in and get a number. Yes? Is that cool? OK. Now, real quick, um, I'm going to ask a question. Because this is the question I thought would happen more. And I definitely want to get this in here. Um, I think this is on the practice test, something like this. But how would I, given this, how would I find this? You would set a y equal to, or you would replace f of x with a y, and then swap the x. No, with no, no, careful. You're thinking about this. This, let me write this a little bit. What does this symbol mean? Uh, the prime. That's my fault. I made it look like a one. So what is the definition of derivative? Oh shit. I'll get it started, right? So that is h goes to zero. You want to memorize this by Friday, right? What's on the top? y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x2. That's what that is. 
This is huge. This is the first real calculus thing we've done. That doesn't mean the other shit doesn't mean anything. I mean, we had to introduce the idea of limit. It's got its own thing. But when you marry limit to slope, now you're able to find the slope of any function anywhere. Holy shit, that's a major step up from what we could do in algebra. We can only deal with straight lines in algebra. Okay. So what is f of x plus h? There's f of x up there, right? <laughs> yeah, you just plug this in there. What do you do? And what's f of x? Well, f of x is 3 over x. Now, here's what... Does anyone have any minor heart palpitations when they see this kind of thing? Fractions inside the Okay, okay. All right. You've got, <laughs> you've got, okay, you've got to get over that. So watch this. Um, what if it, is this problem, uh, this is not pretty, but it's better. If I said, figure this out, 7 over 4 divided by 3. All right, is anybody tripped out by that? I'm sure they're not, because what would you do? 7 force times, I love it, I love it, one third, right? Dividing by three is the same as multiplying by one third. They're the same thing. So there is no division. You guys understand what I'm saying? Division doesn't exist. We just said, well, let's give it a name. Right? Bubble. So if I could put these together to become one fraction, I could do that shit. Good night. There. So don't look at the whole thing. Think about it. Oh, this sucks because there's two fractions. All right, let's make them one. Make them one fraction. How do I make these one fraction? What do I do? By yeah, what does he need that he's got? By the way, yeah, um, yes, he's an X. I really hope nobody thought to add H. You're not allowed to add H. You're not allowed to add anything to the top and bottom of a fraction, correct? So let go it. What does he need? Plus H. So now I can write this. Oh, you poor little marker, you're dying. That's green. Green's not bad. So what do we got? We got 3x. Let me see if you guys are cool with this. Right? I'm going to distribute this. Is this cool? Yeah. This is a really easy place to make a mistake. The negative's got to go through also. Right? That's what I got on top. And then I get x times x plus h over h. Now, one thing I want you to realize, there's a shortcut here. Isn't this 7 over 4 times 3? I don't know. It's 12. It's 12. So the shortcut is 7 over 4 divided by 3. This can just go up there. Because what is 7 being divided by? Isn't it being divided by 4 yeah. and 3? So it's being divided by 4 times 3. So isn't this being divided by this and this? So I can just pull this up here. Right. And just in case, just to really make sure you guys understand what I'm saying, and maybe those of you at home can see this too. Yeah. Even better though, what can you do with the H? Yeah, they die, and isn't that why it was indeterminate from the beginning? Mm -hmm. So now when I put a zero in, what do I get? Negative three over X squared. Yes, negative three over X times X plus zero, so X squared. That is the slope of this at any point. So let's go further. Decent with that? that? That is the method we have now to determine the derivative, which is another name for slope. So there's the slope function from algebra. We give this to it, now it's able to handle curvy things. Now I know the slope everywhere, right? And, and what makes sense? What, what's the slope at zero? Oh, no, yeah, slope at zero would be negative infinity. And if you think about what this thing looks like, is that what that looks like? Isn't this slope big time negative either side is zero? I, I, do you have to really know what it, not really. 
So let me go one more step. What if I said, using what you've done, using what you've done, what have you done? We know this. Find the equation. By the way, this is how I write the equation of the tangent line to f of x at uh, 1, 3. Why not? Does this sound familiar? You should have run across this a few times. You guys doing okay? I just want to tell you real quick how nice it is to see faces instead of black boxes and things. Yes? Don't you, you don't even have to do all that work, right? If you just, because all you do is just, you had 3 over x in the beginning, and you just put x to 6 on. Uh, no, it's no good. Why, why do you think that would work? Why do you think that would well, work? I'm just saying, because isn't it like the derivative of, like the derivative is kind of like the second. Oh, okay. So here's something. Have we proven that yet? in this class. Have we proven it? No. So nobody better do that shit. If you already know derivatives, like you know the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared, that's cool. I don't care. We haven't proven it yet, right? So you have to, unless you can tell me very quickly why that will work for no matter what degree you use, so you have to write me a little paragraph, then I can let you do it, but, okay. So, how do I do this shit? Do I have a point? Sometimes I have a point. But yes, in this, I have a point. What else do I need for the equation of a line? Slope. Slope. Slope where? At that, at that point. point. At that point, more specifically, at x equals one. x equals 1. So how do I figure out the slope is the derivative. So what is f prime of 1? Negative 3. Negative 3, right? That's what the slope is. So this is just one little step removed from the problems you did in algebra, like find the equation of the line that is perpendicular to this one and it goes to the point 1, 7 or whatever. Remember those kind of problems? What do you have to do? Find a slope, get a point, make the equation. That's exactly what we're doing. We just have a calculus way to determine the slope there. So now I could use this formula if I wanted to. Y minus the Y piece equals the slope, x minus the x piece, and then clean this shit up. Plus three, plus three, so plus six, I think. Yes. Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe. Do any of you guys do this and, and solve for b? If you, if you do, you know what I mean. You solve for b? Yeah. That's fine. You can do it that way too. I kind of do this for a reason because this is going to show up again later more calculus of <laughs> Thank you. Right? So we're going to see this same kind of format later this semester. So that's why I keep doing it this way just to kind of remind you. Okay. All right. Is that? The, that, that is exactly the kind of problem I love to ask. Here's a function. Use the definition of derivative to find its derivative. Use what you just found to find the equation line at some point. Right? Okay, some of you guys look beat up. I'm sorry. Anything else? Time. We got time. Yes? Wait, so the one that we did so right, that one's pretty much like number A, B, right? The one that we're supposed to which one again, sorry? Number 8B. Yeah, 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 8B. I thought I put one sort of like, I didn't put a 3, yeah, so it's the same exact thing. I love it. And 8A also, but it's just not looking like this, yes. Uh, and then 9 is like what we just did here. Right? Okay. Let me go ahead and give you guys the answer key, so you got a minute to look that over. Let me know if you think I made a mistake. Yes, 
6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. Is it as far as the key? Yeah, that's yours. Yeah. So obviously, do not give me the practice. Don't turn that shit in. I don't need more paper. So I just gave you all the answers. I don't need to see your practice test. If you didn't try the practice test out and you don't have time, don't do it. Right? The best thing you can do is the homework. But this is kind of like shows you the way I like to set problems up and stuff. I, the first time I ever taught, my class said, what do your tests look like? And I said, I have no idea. So, hey, Corey. You, I, I, you saw my, okay. Uh, Corey's gonna tell you real quick, this is beautiful timing, uh, about the Mass Study Center. Uh, Corey's a tutor in the Mass Study Center. You're working, which days again? Monday, Wednesday. Okay. Let's go. I remember a few of you. Nice. So I am a tutor in the Math Study Center. We are open in person now, 10 to 3, Monday through Thursday. And we are open on Zoom, 10 to 8, Monday through Thursday. And then Friday is only on Zoom from 10 to 3. So Math Study Center, it's a great place to come in, get help with your math homework, or study guides, or anything you need help with the math. It's a great place to just come in and study, work on homework, you might not know you have a question until you're working, and if you're in the Math Study Center, you can just go ahead and ask us. We always have a couple tutors in there, ready and willing to help you out. It is drop-in tutoring, so it's come whenever you like, no appointments needed, and you can ask for help as many times as you want, stay as long as you want. We help each student for five to 10 minutes, then we move on to other students, but we're always willing to come back and help you more. I encourage you to come in as often as you want. Um, come in with your classmates. It's a good place to study with them, collaborate, and then get help if you need it. Any questions? Cool. And there's a, there's a, a program that Corey and whoever's in there can help you sign up for. It's called yeah. WC Online. And that's how we track uh, people that come into the center for all the various reasons. So you can tell how well it's been used and all that kind of stuff. And if you need tutoring and other subjects, we can help you out with that as well. There's plenty of resources. We are located in Building 70, the Tech Mall. It's that big building right in the middle of campus. If you enter in on this side, we're on the left-hand side as you enter in, in room 112. We hope to see you there. Yay! Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Any questions? Any report? questions? Well, you said from 10 to 3, right? 10 to 3. 10 to 3, Monday through Thursday. Yeah. But then if you need help after that, on Zoom, we're open from 10 to 8. The Zoom link should be on Canvas. Yes. And then Fridays, 10 to 3 on Zoom. And then anytime we don't have a gross fund tutor available, there's another program called Net Tutor, And they're like a 24-7 thing. So anytime we don't have a gross fund tutor available, they're available. So if you need help at 2.30 AM, go to Canvas, click on the Net Tutor, and they'll, they can help you. And the Mass Study Center is drop-in tutoring, but we do also offer appointments. We have one person doing appointments at a time. So if you're ever feeling you need to make a, a longer appointment, maybe 30 minutes or an hour, we do offer appointments from 10 to 8, Monday through Thursday, and then 10 to 3 Friday. So we can help you out with that as well if you ever want. Cool. All, All right. right. Thank you. Thanks, for it. I'll see you. I'll see you later. All right, guys. Yes. Um, so for one C, it says the one is negative one three, but as of negative one is negative two. So let me see. On the on the four on the part. Here. Oh, I got you. But it refers to this. Oh yeah, it should be negative two to three. Yeah. I'm averaging about a ninety-seven on my practice test, so. <laughs> Pretty much on average. So it should be negative two to three for one C's range. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah. You said when finding the limits algebraically, you're only allowed to like plug in the value when you know for sure it doesn't break, like when there's continuity. So then for like these ones, would you have to prove there's continuity first and then you can plug in? Well, the great thing is we know polynomial functions are continuous. Yeah. And ratios of functions are continuous as long as the bottom's not zero. Yeah, but do you have to write that down, I guess, as well? No, you don't need to. Okay. Those are pretty straightforward. I mean, those are not going to make you 
unless I, I could have a problem specifically that says prove that this is continuous at this point or whatever. But that's this one is a more direct, we're used to plugging it in just to see what form it's in. And if you plug the number in and you get seven over two, it's obviously continuous because you've got an actual value there, yeah. right? Okay. Yes? Will the test be about this length? It'll look like this. Roughly, I forget how many questions there are, but normally my tests have about 23 or 24 questions. And again, okay. when I say that, I'm counting A, B, C, D. Because oh, okay. I remember I had a teacher that was like, we got four questions on this, and we got the test, and it was A through J. Every one. I'm like, that's not four questions. What the shit? Okay. So when I tell you how many questions, I count A, B, C, D. Okay, thank you. Oh, before I forget, my office. Uh, the woman who used to be in the Mass Study Center, the classified staff who oversaw the daily operations, is retiring. She's not going to be on campus. So I have moved my office into the Mass Study Center. That little room that's got the glass in, on it, that's right next to it for anybody who's been there. So I'm there now, and I'm going to update the hours on the canvas to tell you when I'm in there. Because I'm going to be in there more than my regular office hours. So you guys can stop by whenever. Uh, so I'll update that. Um, all right, yeah, we're pretty, doing pretty good. Anything else that looks like I messed up on here or any other questions? I think I finished the, yeah, hey, Jeff. Like number 11, uh, does everybody understand the problem like number 11 has multiple answers? Mm -hmm. So the, it only matters what's happening at those specific, like at negative one, at two, at those kind of things. And how you connect them is up to you, right? Oh, and I didn't put, so I will tell you this, I didn't put this kind of problem on here, but I'll tell you right now, um, you'll be really excited to know that you will have a problem where, I don't know why I didn't put it on there, where they give you the function and you have to sketch f prime, which everybody loves. So for example, um, if I give you this function, yeah, stop the crazy. <laughs> and then I want you to sketch f prime. So this is f. And I want to know what is f prime. Does anybody remember where to start? What's the first? Oh things you plot. Zero. Yes, because that's the place the, like right there, the slope is zero, correct? So everything I'm doing in blue represents the slope at that x value. So here it's in zero, here it's zero. That's it. What's true about the slope back here? Positive. Positive. So therefore, like right here, it should be up here. And then it's getting smaller, smaller, positive. So therefore, this graph should get smaller and smaller. And then it becomes negative. Does everybody remember we did a few of these? But this, people really, your brain starts to say, no, let's just follow the graph. No. Um, isn't it most negative or about right there? So that should be about where it's the deepest. And then it's becoming less negative, so it becomes zero here. And now it's positive and growing until about right here, I think, maybe. I really want you guys to understand. Do you have to be that specific? No, but it's kind of nice to know where the peak should be, roughly. That's the most positive slope, because then it starts to come back down, slope-wise, right? It's not growing as fast up here. And then eventually it's zero again, and now it's negative. And now it does sort, this is what's evil, it does sort of follow the graph just because it's going down and the slope is negative. Yes? Are you going to give us the equation for the function? No. no. Not at all. <laughs> but for those of you who know something about derivatives, do you guys agree with me that this is an x to the fourth? Remember, one, two, three turning points. Yeah. So it's probably about an x to the fourth. And of course, what's the blue? Cubic. So that's kind of showing you that a fourth power, when you take a derivative, becomes a cube, right? And again, there's some kind of coefficients and all shit, but this is sort of like x to the fourth. This is sort of like x cubed. Derivatives make the power go down. We still have to prove that, but there's visually it kind of looks like it does. 
Is that all right? So I didn't put that kind of problem on there for some reason, but it will definitely be on the test. And it's in the homework. Okay. How are you guys feeling? You guys feeling concerned? You feel better? Better in person. Person's yeah. good, yes. I agree. Because that's often when I'm signing out. <laughs> Then I just watch the videos. I sign out and then I would be like, oh, hey, are you out there? It's because somebody's still there on my screen. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, how long have you not been there? Okay, well, okay. Sometimes I would accidentally forget to press sign out and I would you. Gotcha, okay. That might explain something. That is not like Okay, gotcha. So that's a possibility. Okay. All right, guys, so you're free to go. Uh, if you have any questions, you can hang out for a minute. Ask me, ask away. Yes, the test is chapter one up through two eight. So Everything we've covered. Would this be like the general kinds of problems? Oh, all right, you ready for a very teacher answer? The concepts that are on the practice test will also be on the test. Well, for example, the one about the the one I just said. Yeah. Yeah. Like the number line. But this captures, besides that, this captures all the ideas. No. This is where you got to be careful. I'm not just going to take the practice test, change the numbers, and give it to you as a test. <laughs> you with me? And I'm not going to do it like some of my colleagues and give you the same test as the practice test. That's actually happened to me like last year. And that's bullshit. I had, a, I had a, uh, exam, and I was doing practice exams because I was, I was taking some bad at so I'm sure I'm people like would probably agree. For three days on end, just sure. to get ready for an exam, and like the five of the questions on the final exam were exactly oh. the same as on yeah. some of the practice tests. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. As a student, that might sound like a, an appealing thing, but at the same time, you're not learning shit. You just regurgitating stuff. I agree, but at the same time, I was like, oh. <laughs> Don't expect that from me. Yes. On Friday, like, when we're done with that, yeah. When you're done, you can get out. Gold. Yes. In the future, are we turning homework in person? Like, like with papers? Oh, and stuff? Uh, yes, totally. Oh, thank you for saying that. Don't submit, and you might notice I didn't put any more after 2 6, I think, on Canvas to turn in. Because now oh, I did. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Just in case somebody wants to turn in or own. Please, dear God, turn, turn work in physically. Oh my God, I hate grading shit on Oh wait, does that mean that, like, let's say we haven't turned in like 2.5 and 2.6? Yes, anything, because I keep track of both. So whatever, if there's stuff you haven't turned in, you can turn in physically, you're good. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, like, with the keyboards, just keep track of the work digitally? No. <laughs>